When looking at the SEC projections for the 2023 football season, are the Tennessee Volunteers that much better than the South Carolina Gamecocks? Our Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for the latest headlines and potential storylines on South Carolina Gamecock athletics. I'm Andrew Lyon, the host of this podcast and also the lead staff writer for Gamecocks Digest over on SI.com. Thank you for making Locked On Gamecocks your first listen or watch here today. We are free and available on YouTube and also wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. It's time to address another notion that has manifested across the national landscape in college football when looking ahead to the 2023 college football season. And that notion involves South Carolina and one of their counterparts in their division in the Tennessee Volunteers. And it involves mainly this question. Why can't South Carolina be second in the Eastern Division? Why can't they finish right behind Georgia in 2023? Because when you look at what people are saying, what pundits are saying across the sport right now, for the most part, people continue to make it out like there is a sizable gap between the Tennessee Volunteers and the South Carolina Gamecocks. And Honestly, when you look at both teams and what else happened the last couple years and what's taken place so far this offseason, I don't see really where people get this train of thought. Now, I know that some people are going to say that, Andrew, it doesn't matter what the media thinks because that doesn't decide how the season is going to play out. And yes, you would be correct with at least part of that statement, but The part about where it doesn't matter what the media thinks isn't entirely true because the media, they can't decide the outcome of games, but they do control the perception of these football teams. And as we've talked about on this show before, perception matters a great deal, especially when you're a team like South Carolina that is not given the benefit of the doubt like some of these other programs in the conference. And we'll continue to talk about that as we go through today's show. South Carolina is perceived for example, to be a lesser program than the Tennessee Volunteers. And that's in spite of how close these two have matched up in terms of what they've done in the past two seasons specifically. In 2020, just for context, Tennessee went 3-7. South Carolina went 2-8. Both programs wound up firing their football coaches within a four-month span of one another. In 2021, when looking at the projections heading into that season, South Carolina was projected by pretty much everyone to win either three games, four games, or five games. Not really anything lower or higher than that range. They wound up going 7-6, and and they won their bowl game. Tennessee, on the other hand, their projected floor for wins in 2021 was five, which was the ceiling for South Carolina in spite of all the losses that they had in the transfer portal and the fact it was a first-year coaching staff. Tennessee also wound up going seven and six. They did lose their bowl game. And to be fair, comparing both programs, they blew out South Carolina at home that season. There's no getting around that. Now, let's move on to 2022. South Carolina this past fall, despite the massive leap and improvement that they made in year one under Shane Beamer and the transfer portal class that they brought in, was projected for some odd reason to win six or seven games, with a few people even projecting five wins because of the quote-unquote tough schedule, while Tennessee was projected to win eight to ten games and finish second in the East on most accounts. South Carolina went eight and five, They did lose their bowl game in the final minutes to the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, but they also defeated Tennessee by a final score of 63-38. to Tennessee, on the other hand, they had their best season in the last 15 years of their program history. They went 11-2 overall, and that included a win in the Orange Bowl over the Clemson Tigers. Now, heading into 2023... South Carolina, they have lost, obviously, some pretty solid players and some players that were key contributors for their team this past season. Guys like a Marshawn Lloyd, a Jaheim Bell, 
Cam Smith, and other valuable starters on their team. But those were sort of the bigger names at the top of this list. But Tennessee, they're going through the same exact kind of deal on their side of things in terms of roster turnover because they're losing guys like Hendon Hooker, like Jalen Hyatt, like Cedric Tillman, Darnell Wright, Byron Young. And that is not all of the guys that are going to be walking out the door or have already walked out the door at this point. Since Josh Heupel and Shane Bimmer took over both of these programs, one of them has gotten the benefit of the doubt far more every single step of the way, that obviously being Josh Heupel in Tennessee, in terms of their projection of what they're going to do and the attention that they have been given. And guess what? Gamecock fans, you better buckle up and you better grab your popcorn because it is going to happen again this offseason. It already has begun. And remember, South Carolina at the beginning of this past offseason was projected to potentially be a dark horse by some analysts in the college football realm. So not everyone was, you know, degrading South Carolina is my point. But as the offseason continued to progress, what did we start to see? South Carolina is projected to finish 5th in the East, 4th in the East. Kentucky, Tennessee, Florida, you name it. All those programs, they're all going to finish ahead of South Carolina. That 7-6 and six season, that was just an overachieving year for Shane Beamer and his staff. That was just an anomaly. The Gamecocks will regress back to the mean just like, oh, wait a second. They won 8 games. They were actually one spot away from finishing 2nd in the East behind Georgia in just year 2 under Shane Beamer. Huh. You know, they did pretty good there. But you know what? Third place in the SEC East. It's ridiculous. It is completely ludicrous. It's a slap in the face to the program. But guess what? It is happening again. And going back to the personnel losses that I just mentioned a minute ago, I've seen and listened to plenty of people talk about how the reason why they've got South Carolina maybe not take another step forward this next year is because of the losses they've suffered this offseason. And here's the thing. I don't necessarily have a problem with that, right? And I will admit, there are certain spots where there are some question marks, especially the defensive end position like we've talked about before. But here's my thing. Tennessee is going through the same sort of deal with losing, again, vital players, not some backups that got rotated in, guys that basically were the reason why they won 11 games last season. And yet it feels like outside of losing head and hooker, people are choosing to basically glance over that when it comes to Tennessee and because of their logo and the fact that for the first time in 15, 16 years, they finally gave college football fans something to actually be excited about with their football program. South Carolina has done way more in that same span. They're just now getting penciled in at number two. So Go figure. South Carolina, again, and we're going to continue this conversation in just a few moments when we talk about SEC expansion with Texas and Oklahoma now joining in 2024. But the Gamecocks, they just are, they're asked to do way more than almost every other team, it seems like, in this division outside of maybe Missouri, Kentucky, and Vanderbilt. When it comes to Florida, Tennessee, and Georgia, good luck. In terms of perception, South Carolina's got to work 10 times harder to earn it compared to those programs. So... It's, it's a ludicrous notion, but it is one that, once again, the Gamecocks are going to have to fight. In spite of the fact that when you look at the results on paper and what the Gamecocks are doing right now compared to Tennessee on the recruiting trail, newsflash, they are not that far behind. And if South Carolina beats Tennessee again this season, it's going to be a wonder what people are going to start saying then. So, of course, we'll see how all that shakes out when this upcoming fall actually arrives. And hopefully it'll be sooner rather than later for all of us who are massive college football fans. But of course, we do have SEC expansion to talk about because it is going to have an impact on South Carolina and what they're going to be expected to do this next season. But before we get into all that, I do want to let y'all know that today's show is brought to you by Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat, you're looking for a new protein bar to stack in your coverage, you have got to get Built Bar. Built Bar literally offers everything that you could possibly want in a protein bar. You want it to be healthy? Obviously, it checks off that box. You want it to be extremely enjoyable? It checks off that box as well. 
You want multiple flavors to where you're not just buying basically vanilla, chocolate, or cookies and cream, or strawberry. The four most bland flavors that you can get from almost every other protein powder or every other protein bar then you have got to get Built Bar. It's 130 calories, just 4 grams of sugar, and 17 grams of protein. You can get these bars at your local Walmart or Sam's Club right now. If you go to Walmart, go to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a 4-bar box. You can get flavors like cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs at Sam's Club. You can grab a 13-bar box that includes flavors like brownie batter and churro. I promise you, you will not regret this decision, and you will end up thanking me later because Built Bar is fantastic, it's enjoyable, and it's got a variety of options to choose from, and it is also where Tasty is the new healthy. Welcome back to this Tuesday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. Thank you for making Locked On Gamecocks your first listen every day. Make sure you check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball, where you'll find everything you need to know about college basketball in just one place. Plus, you'll hear from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and also wherever you get your podcasts. Oklahoma and Texas are joining the SEC sooner rather than later. The original arrival date was expected to be the year 2025. Of course, with the amount of money that both Oklahoma and Texas have from the oil industry and a lot of their alumni and boosters, there was a lot of people that speculated that it probably would not take that long for both of these historic college football programs to join the SEC, and it appears now that that is indeed the case. As late last week, there was multiple reports from multiple national voices of the sport that both schools have come to an exit agreement with the Big 12 Conference. I believe the exit fee is like $100 million collectively between both Texas and and Oklahoma. Now, of course, we're not here to talk about Texas and Oklahoma and how it impacts maybe those programs. We're here to talk about how it impacts South Carolina. What does it mean for South Carolina that Texas and Oklahoma are joining the conference now one year earlier? Well, what it means is this. Perceived progress in 2023 is now all the more imperative. The Gamecocks have got to take another step forward. They certainly cannot take a step backwards now that both of these programs are going to be joining the SEC this next year. So there's a couple reasons why it is imperative for South Carolina to make progress on the field in 2023. Firstly, once Texas and Oklahoma join the conference, again, going back to perception, South Carolina is a team that is going to be knocked down a couple pegs in the SEC hierarchy automatically. And I know some of you might be sitting there thinking, well, Andrew, doesn't it matter that the Gamecocks have now been in the conference for over three decades? No. No, forget it. It, it. That's not going to matter at all. Texas and Oklahoma, in terms of their brand, in terms of their history, and in terms of the fan bases and everything, the SEC is going to welcome them with open arms like they have been a part of the conference for decades now. It is not going to matter that South Carolina, Vanderbilt, Arkansas, Missouri, Texas, and it is not going to matter that all of these programs who are, I guess, are sort of considered to be in that bottom half of the SEC hierarchy have been in this league for at least a decade or more now in their program's history. That's not going to matter at all. Texas and Oklahoma joining means that South Carolina now has got to move a couple spots further back in line. And here's the other thing. With this expansion, with college football realignment that's taking place within these conferences, the current era of NIL, the transfer portal, along with realignment, has turned college football into a holistic and sectionalistic arms race. What I mean by that is basically national arms race and an arms race by conference. And we talked about this this past summer with South Carolina battling these other programs in the SEC East. Again, while it remains the SEC East for just a little bit longer, you know, going up against teams like a Georgia, like a Tennessee and a Florida, what are you doing in terms of NIL? What are you doing in terms of your facilities? What are you doing in terms of making sure that everyone is in lockstep, making sure everyone from the athletic department to the 
program itself, to the fans, to boosters, alumni. What are you doing to make sure that everyone is rowing in the same direction? It sounds like a very cliche statement, but look, over the next couple of years, that small of a component, something that seems so minuscule in terms of just how much everyone's on the same page, could make the difference between South Carolina being maybe in the top five in the conference or being middle of the pack to a little bit below the middle of the pack in the conference. Right now, South Carolina, because of what they did last year and what they have continued to do this offseason, they are in the upper echelon of the SEC East. But soon, again, that viewpoint is not going to matter at all because South Carolina now has to compare themselves to the entire field of teams in the SEC conference. When you look at the entire field and where South Carolina stands currently, right now, I would say that South Carolina in terms of maybe a power ranking, I guess, are probably fifth in the conference because of what all they have done. I would put South Carolina right now behind Alabama, LSU, Georgia, and Tennessee to a very small extent, of course, as I talked about earlier, and that's in no particular order. But they're going to go down at least one spot when Texas and Oklahoma both join the SEC in 2024. And again, I know that we have talked about this, and it sounds like a broken record at this point, but it is worth repeating. In spite of the clear proof of concept, both on and off the field, that Shane Beamer and this coaching staff have had here in Columbia in a short time up to this point in his head coaching career, college football's media elite, with the way that this business operates, they are going to want to see even more from South Carolina. Even though they beat two top 10 teams this past year as an unranked team in both occasions, that's not going to matter this year. And of course, most people would say that, well, last year's results don't matter at all for any team. That's not true, okay? And you don't need me to tell you all that, but that's not true at all. It doesn't matter that they went up in their win toll, that they went to a much better bowl game, that Spencer Rattler actually really got a lot better, especially, of course, at the end of the season. That South Carolina defeated three top 25 teams, got a bunch of monkeys off their back, beating Texas A&M, defeating Tennessee, and getting revenge on multiple teams that just embarrassed them in 2021. None of that is going to matter now because everyone is now going to be looking full steam ahead to when this conference is going to drastically shift completely. Texas and Oklahoma is going to create a seismic impact on this conference. And here's the thing. They might not be ready as soon as they arrive, but let's not sit here and act like that Texas and Oklahoma are just going to sit there and twiddle their thumbs and just hope that, you know, by pure luck, ends up stumbling their way into the SEC championship game or the college football playoff or whatever it is that the system calls for in the next few years. Obviously, with all the ongoing changes, we don't know what that's going to look like. But South Carolina is going to have to work even harder now than they already have in the past 24 months. And you can make the argument that compared to the first two seasons, these next 12 months are going to be the most important months for Shane Beamer and this football program since he arrived in Columbia. Now, another season that's getting ready to start literally later this week is South Carolina's baseball season. The Gamecocks baseball team will be taking the field later this week against the UMass Lowell Riverhawks. And it is sure to be an interesting season, of course, for the South Carolina Gamecocks. And we got a lot to talk about in terms of what this team could look like this season. In just a couple moments, I'm going to talk about the starting pitching rotation. Who are maybe the locks for that rotation? Who are some contenders for that final spot? We'll dive into all that and more right here on Locked On Gamecocks. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now's the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. You heard me correctly, $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and maybe three-pointers made in a game. And my favorite NBA bet for this week is LeBron James, Team LeBron James, that is at the All-Star game 
for the money line minus 126 because I think that because of the fact LeBron James has now broken Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's all-time scoring record in NBA history, I think that he's going to be a lot more loose. I think he's going to be a little bit more energized and quite honestly, I feel like that now that he has gotten that record, I think that LeBron is just going to be phenomenal at the all-star game and I just got a really good feeling that that's going to sort of permeate out to the rest of his teammates during the all-star break so I'm picking the money line minus 126 for team LeBron to win the all-star game this year plus FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay so don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports book partner of the NBA. Welcome back to today's edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your team every single day in just 30 minutes. South Carolina's baseball team will be taking the baseball diamond later on this week. So it's time to preview the team and what it could look like this upcoming spring. So let's start off on today's show with the starting pitching rotation. So to begin this conversation, let's go over some of probably the more obvious selections here for this part of the pitching staff. Starting off with Will Sanders, who I would basically just describe as The naturally gifted. I mean, in terms of high-level potential, Will Sanders, obviously, for the last couple years has been viewed as the best pitcher in South Carolina's staff. He's got a deep arsenal of pitches, four to five that he can throw to home plate, which is phenomenal and a rarity for a college pitcher. You do not see too many guys that's got that much stuff that they can lean on. He's also a seasoned veteran at this point, and certainly the seasoned veteran of this group, as he has started 25 games in his career and played in 37 overall. Will Sanders is definitely going to be expected to be the tone setter for this pitching staff this upcoming season season so expect Will Sanders to definitely be that Friday night starter for South Carolina and then the second obvious pick for the starting rotation here is going to be Noah Hall without a question who I term simply the workhorse of this pitching staff Noah Hall in my opinion in terms of sort of how he plays the game is a little bit of a throwback in terms of his ability to consistently pitch deep into ball games when you watch baseball Most of the time these days, you see starting pitchers now getting pulled out earlier than ever before, barely ever making it past six innings pitched, which obviously just 10 to 15 years ago would have been just shocking if your starting pitcher couldn't go that deep into a game, especially if they only gave up a couple of runs here and there. But Noah Hall, he is someone that is able to go five, six, seven innings. And he had five different starts this past season where he pitched seven plus innings, which for South Carolina's case last year was a big deal because of all the injuries they dealt with in their bullpen. And the other thing with Noah Hall, he got progressively better as last season went along. He started off with a 7.48 ERA over his first 26 innings. But over the final 50 and two-third innings that he pitched, He had a 3.08 ERA. He got even better in conference play, which is usually when newcomers sort of hit a wall. That was not the case with Noah Hall this past spring. Now, admittedly, Noah does not have the same stuff as Will Sanders, but the guy is just an absolute bulldog on the mound. He's a very fiery competitor, and he's certainly somebody that even when he gives up a couple of of bases. If the bases are loaded, maybe there's runners on second and third. Noah Hall did a really good job last season of, especially later in the year, more often than not, getting himself out of these jams. And that's something that you need out of one of your starting pitchers. So needless to say, Will Sanders and Noah Hall, they are two locks to be in the starting rotation this season. Now, there's three other contenders that could end up getting this final spot. 
And we'll start off with Matthew Becker. Matthew Becker was the freshman sensation this past year, especially after his massive series clenching win over the Texas Longhorns. He became a household name in game cognition for what he did against a top 10 ranked team on that day. And he also gave a very valiant effort the very next weekend against what was admittedly a very good team in the Tennessee Volunteers, despite how pompous and arrogant that they were, even though they hadn't done anything to deserve it, quite honestly. But I digress. He did have a bit of a freshman wall, though, and was put back in the bullpen after a couple more starts went sideways. He bounced around between maybe being a setup guy, being a closer, a different game. And it just never seemed like this pitching staff really knew where to sort of station Matthew Becker in terms of what his role should be. And honestly, last season, I questioned that a lot before I joined this podcast and I just really felt like that may have hurt his development a little bit. We'll see, of course, if that is the case once he gets into this season. Matthew Becker has a chance to potentially be that third star. He's got solid off-speed stuff, especially his curveball, which might be the best curveball on the entire roster, honestly. And he can also throw for a lot of strikes when he is on. Plus... He's also a left-handed pitcher, and that's not to say, of course, you have to have a left-handed pitcher in your starting rotation, but it definitely helps out the guys, and it does force the opposing team to have to strategize a little bit more based on having that kind of player in your rotation. So, in terms of some of the experiences that he got, maybe both good and bad this past year, and what he could offer, Matthew Becker could very well be that third starter, but another guy that could be that third starter is Jack Mahoney. Now, Jack Mahoney was a little bit more on the quieter side in terms of the headlines this past spring. And the reason for that was because he had Tommy John surgery back in his freshman campaign in 2021. And that forced him to play a lot more at first base, maybe left field this past season. But Jack Mahoney is returning to the pitcher's mound in 2023. And here's the thing. Jack Mahoney has absolute gas with his fastball. This guy can throw 98, 99 miles per hour with his fastball. He is that modern-day velocity-driven pitcher. Now, admittedly, my question with that would be, okay, well, it's great that he can throw 98, 99 miles per hour with his fastball, but what kind of off-speed stuff could he offer if he gets into a jam, if a team manages to key in on his fastball? That is something that, you know, has to be answered by Jack. And I did see, of course, a couple of the scrimmages this past fall. Haven't been to any recently, admittedly. But when I saw Jack Mahoney, his fastball looked phenomenal. But if he had to go to his off-speed stuff, he did get in a little bit of trouble in terms of his command. So we'll see, of course, if he winds up being a starter or who knows. Maybe he could be a long reliever or maybe even a setup man or closer. I think Mahoney is a Swiss Army knife in terms of where he could end up on this staff this coming season. And then the last guy to watch in terms of this final starting rotation spot here is Eli Jerzenbeck. Jerzenbeck is the freshman phenom, quote-unquote, out of this group that is going to make things a little bit more interesting this spring. He was a perfect game All-American coming out of high school. He was rated as a top 70 prospect according to perfect game. And the thing is, this kid has got MLB pedigree. His father played for the New York Yankees back in his heyday. So, Jerzen Beck, he is not somebody to sleep on. At the very minimum, I could see Jerzen Beck getting some valuable starting experience by him starting out as the midweek guy on that Tuesday and Wednesday night game. And then, if he's doing quite well, and maybe one of the starters on the weekend rotation is faltering to start the season, then maybe they test out what he can do as a weekend starter and throw him in on a Saturday or a Sunday. We'll have to see, of course, how all that plays out. But needless to say, South Carolina's got a lot of options to work with with their starting rotation, and you certainly cannot have enough pitchers in this regard when you're playing the sport of baseball. So Mark Kingston and company, they got to be at least optimistic in terms of what they could throw out there on the mound this upcoming spring. But with that being said, y'all, that is going to do it for today's show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. I hope y'all thoroughly enjoyed today's show, as always. What are your thoughts on the notion that Tennessee is maybe the consensus second best team in the SEC East? Do you think that South Carolina has got a more compelling case to offer than people are giving them credit for? What do you think SEC expansion in 2024 does for Shane Beamer and South Carolina's football team? Does it change anything? Does it not change anything? And what are your thoughts on the starting rotation for the Gamecocks baseball team 
in 2023. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments section if you're watching today's show on YouTube, or you could shoot me a direct message at a line underscore SC on Twitter, and I'll try to respond to your message or comment as quickly as I see it. And once again, don't forget to make Locked On College Basketball your second listen or watch now that you have watched or listened to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. But once again, y'all, that does it for me on today's show. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, and I will catch y'all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast.